Happy Sabbath, everyone. Amen. Praise the Lord for our children. Amen? Amen. Amen. I've said this already several times, and I'll just say it again. I've been here for nine years, and that was the best VBS this church has ever had. Amen? Amen. So the last time that uh, I was here with you, last couple times I was here with you, we were looking at the biblical analogies that God uses for his people, for his church. First couple of ones that we looked at was the bread. We are one bread. We are partakers of that one bread, and that bread is Jesus Christ. We are also that one body, and united together as many members, we constitute that one body, which is Jesus Christ. And then after that, we looked at the living stones. As we are living stones, we are built together to make up that one temple for God through the Spirit. And so these are the analogies that the Bible uses to show the different characteristics of God's church. Through these different analogies, there's different things that, that come up from it, different characteristics, different responsibilities. They're, they're each unique in their different ways. And so God is using these to show us what our duties are, what our responsibilities are, what we should look like as a church. And the one thing that comes out time and time again is the unification of God's people, that we should be united together as one, we saw this right there in the Sabbath school lesson this week, the unity of God's church, the unity and the gospel of God. And so these are ways that we can see that. But then in today, what we're going to look at is God's church, the Bible, I think more times uses this analogy than any of the others, that we are the bride of Christ. We are the bride, God's people likened to a beautiful woman. And so this is the analogy that we're going to look, like, look at today. And so if you could please bow your heads with, we, with me and let's uh, have a word of prayer before we open up God's word. Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful for giving us your word. We're so thankful for the light that you have given us to lighten our path. And Father, we want to find our way to you. We said it's through Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life that we can come to the Father. And so Father, we want to be brought up to your presence now. We want your spirit to be here among us, teaching us and guiding us through this truth that you've given us today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So go with me to Jeremiah 6 and verse 2. We're going to start in the Old Testament. We're going to work our way forward uh, because what we see in the Old Testament is a, a consistency that, that the Bible is using, that God used with the very, his early people, the Israelite nation. And we want to see how God spoke of his people and the, the duties there of his people, what they're supposed to look like. You know, in the last presentation that we saw, um, that we were the living stones built up to that temple. We saw that God's people at the very end of time would make up that fourth temple. But then we saw that there were other temples that were brought together. We saw that Jerusalem and Zion that God's sanctuary would be there, seated on top of Mount Zion, there in Jerusalem. And that was where God's people, that's where God would be dwelling in the midst of his people. And so Jerusalem and Zion was a representation of God's people. And in Jeremiah 6 and verse 2, we see here, Jeremiah 6 and verse 2, it says, I have likened the daughter of Zion to a comely and delicate woman, God's people. A woman. Jerusalem and Zion being synonymous here. Isaiah 51 and verse 16 says, And say unto Zion, Thou art my people. God's people. The daughter of Zion. This was to be his, his bride. This was to be the woman of, of his life. And God wanted to be joined together with his people in a special relationship. No one else was to, to interfere with. In a marriage, the way that God had designed it, it was to be one man and one woman. That the two may come together and that they would be one. And so God wanted to be that way with his people. He wanted to be united with his people. He didn't want any other man, any, uh, anyone else, to come and interfere with the relationship that he had with his people. And so this was what he wanted to show us through this. It was through the covenant relationship that God had made with his people that he entered into 
a marriage relationship. You could say maybe even an engagement with his people. You know, back then, to be engaged was a little more serious than what we look at engagement today. Uh, an engagement today is sometimes a promise that may or may not work out in the end. Um, you know, that ring would be given back to that person uh, if, if the, the engagement was called off or it didn't work out for whatever reason. But back in, uh, we could say, Bible times, uh, an engagement was very serious. An engagement was a very serious, that, that was your wife. This was the chosen one for you. They did not wait for the marriage to, be, uh, to go all the way through before uh, if something were to happen, if the woman found another man, that would have been still considered adultery even though they weren't married. And so God entering into this covenant relationship with his people there at Mount Sinai, he had become the husband to his people. And we see this in Jeremiah 31, 31. So if you go with me there, Jeremiah 31, 31 the way God describes himself to his people and what had happened to this marriage relationship, this covenant that he had made with his people. What happened to it? In Jeremiah 31, 31, it said, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a what? I was a husband to them. So when he's there at Mount Sinai and he tells them, if you do this, if you keep my laws, my statutes, my judgments, I will make of you a great nation. You will be a kingdom of priests, a peculiar nation, a peculiar people. If you do this, what, did, what was the people's response? All the, the, the Lord has spoken, we will do. They said, yes, I do. We will enter into this covenant. When people are married, they have a covenant with each other. And this is what God had entered into with his people. But there, not even 40 days passed when God had made that covenant arrangement. When the people said, I do, what had happened? They built up a golden calf right there at the, mount, at the foot of Mount Sinai. And they broke that covenant agreement with God. Now... Did God divorce his people at that point, even though his people had committed adultery on them? Did he take his wife and put her away? No, he kept her. The covenant was still broken. It needed to be fixed. But he kept her. So go with me to Ezekiel 16, and we're going to see the way God feels about his people in light and in spite of all that she has found herself to become an adulterous woman. And in Ezekiel 16, we're going to see a beautiful picture of, of how God describes his people. Ezekiel 16, we'll begin in verse 8. Ezekiel 16, verse 8 says, Now when I passed by thee, and looked upon thee, behold, thy time was the time of love. And I spread my skirt over thee and covered thy nakedness. Yea, I swear unto thee, and entered into a covenant with thee, saith the Lord God, and thou becamest mine. When God saw his people in bondage, he saw his people there in Egypt, he wanted to make them a great nation. He saw them in the midst of their wickedness, in the midst of their wretchedness, in the midst of their suffering there in slavery, he saw her, his people, and he said, I want her to be mine. And so I'm going to cover her nakedness. I'm going to enter into a covenant with her. And you became mine. Verse 9, it says, Then I washed thee with water. Yea, I thoroughly washed thee away the blood from thee, and I anointed thee with oil. I clothed thee also with broidered work, shod thee with badger skin, and girded thee about with fine linen, and I covered thee with silk. I decked thee also with ornaments, and put bracelets upon thy hands, and a chain on thy neck. And I put a jewel on thy forehead, and earrings in thine ears, and a beautiful crown upon thine head. Thus wast thou decked with gold and silver, and thy raiment was of fine linen and silk embroidered work. Thou didst eat fine flour and honey and oil, and thou wast exceeding beautiful, and thou didst prosper into a kingdom. 
Thy renown went forth among the heathen for thy beauty, for it was perfect through my comeliness, which I had put upon thee, saith the Lord God. The beauty that God's bride has is because of the beauty he has given it. He has clothed it and he has decked it. He has decked her ready for a wedding. This is the way that a, a woman back then would have dressed up. The jewelry wasn't a, a normal, or everyday thing. But for that wedding day, she, she decked herself out. She was there, prepared as a bride for her husband. And God is saying that I did this to her. I gave this to her. Your beauty was because of me. But then notice what happens. In verse 15 it says, But thou didst trust in thine own beauty, and playest the harlot, because of thy renown, and pourest out thy fornications on everyone that passed by. His it was. And of thy garments thou didst take, and deckest thy high places with diverse colors, and playest the harlot thereupon. The like thing shall not come, neither shall it be so. The marriage covenant between God and his people had been broken. As we saw last time, the covenant was broken and God allowed for Jerusalem to be destroyed. Babylon came in, surrounded it, besieged it, and destroyed it because the covenant was broken. God's people were therefore under the curses of the covenant. Did God put away his wife forever? Did he divorce her and say, no more, I'm going to find a new wife? Did he do that? No, he says, I'm going to give her another chance. I'm going to give her another chance. Just like God told Hosea, says, don't divorce your wife. She's a prostitute. She's going to be found with other men, but don't divorce her because this is the relationship I have with my people. I will never let her go. I will never forsake her. Even though she continually is found cheating on me, I'm not going to let her go. And so God allowed for his people to go back and rebuild. But it was prophesied in Daniel that what would happen, that through the rebuilding of the temple, that they would now be found keeping covenant with him? Or but would they, would they yet once again fail? The temple once again would be destroyed. Rome came and destroyed the city and the temple once again because God's people rejected the covenants and they rejected Jesus Christ, the messenger of the covenant himself. But Jesus came, he confirmed that covenant to fulfill and to accomplish all that we could not. And at this time, Christ is here setting up a new relationship, not with a new bride, but a new relationship with his people. It's not going to be through literal Jerusalem anymore. The city has already been destroyed twice. God is not there working through a specific people, through the Israelites, through the, through the Jews. Now it's gone out to the whole world. God is going to make his Christian church, his people. If we are Christ, then we are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Amen? Amen? And so now we are a part of his church, and God is bringing us up to be his bride. The covenant, although the covenant was broken, although Christ's bride had cheated on him, God is choosing to stay with his bride. And once again, he's, Ezekiel 16 is going to be repeated. He's going to clothe her. He's going to cover her. And she's going to be a beautiful bride adorned for her husband. 2 Corinthians 11, go with me there. So we see now here in the New Testament that God is, is not starting fresh with a new woman, but he is starting fresh with his bride. The bride that has always existed. It was never a different woman. It's always been the same woman. But now God is starting over. He's going to start slowly. He's going to enter into this relationship. He wants to be espoused to her. And in 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 2, it says, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. God has high hopes for this bride. Even though she has committed fornication on her husband, what does God still call his bride? A chaste virgin. The apple of his eye, even though she had defiled herself, God says she will be presented to him pure and spotless. This is what God can do through his people. Ephesians 5, verse 25 through 27 says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, 
that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. God is able to make dirt and turn it into the very image of himself. God is able to take this harlot woman and turn it into a spotless, pure, holy bride to himself. Isn't that amazing what God can do through his people? We're going to see Ezekiel 16 repeated. So here's the picture. God is longing to be reunited with his bride for that relationship with his partner to be reconciled. For you, the bride of Christ, you are being called to be reunited with your beloved. He is calling every single one of us to be united together as one bride to be reunited with our beloved, Jesus Christ, that one husband that we have been espoused to. So with this picture, Christ uses several parables using a marriage. He likes to talk about marriage. Marriage is a beautiful thing to God. Along with the Sabbath, what was the only other thing instituted there in the Garden of Eden? It was a marriage. So we, can, we, we know that the Sabbath is a beautiful thing. We are all here on Sabbath. But right next to that was that beautiful wedding that God gave to Adam and Eve. It's right there next to it because it is a picture of of God and his people. So in Matthew 22, if you want to go with me there, we're going to look at how Jesus talks about a marriage. Matthew 22, we'll just begin in verse 1. It says, And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables, and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king, which made a marriage for his son, and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Again he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatlings are killed, all things are ready, come unto the marriage. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant, who is the remnant? This was God's people, the remnant, the very ones who were being called into the marriage. It says, and the remnant took his servants and treated them spitefully and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth. He sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. That's exactly what happened to Jerusalem, isn't it? Those servants were God's prophets. Over and over and over, God was sending prophet after prophet after prophet And the message was always the same. Come to the wedding. Come to the wedding. Come to the marriage. You are the bride of Christ. Should the bride not be ready for her own wedding? He's saying, come to the wedding. Be prepared. Come to the wedding. But they took the message lightly. Therefore, God allowed for his people to fall under the covenant curses, and the city was destroyed. But notice in verse 8, Does he not give them another chance? Verse 8, it says, Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Again, even though they fell under the curse, even though the city was destroyed, even though they were given another chance, once again they were found to be not worthy. But look at verse 9 and 10. Go ye therefore, he's speaking to his servants, into the highways, and as many as you shall find bid to the marriage. When God's people had forsaken that last call there and Jerusalem once again was destroyed, God says, this gospel is going out to all the world. All the Gentiles, all of us here, now we are the people of the covenant. We are the one that have entered into that special relationship to be that special people with God. And we have been called to come to the wedding. We have been called to be the bride at the wedding. Look at verse 10. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. Amen? We have been called. He uses as a picture of the guests. That's all of us here. 
All of us here together, we are made to be that bride. God has called us, and he wants us to be ready. He wants us to come to the wedding. So this brings up the question, when is the wedding? When is the wedding? When, when is it that, as the bride of Christ, that we enter into holy matrimony with Jesus Christ? That's a question we should be able to answer. When is that wedding? Is it when Jesus Christ comes back and takes us up into heaven and, and we have a, a wedding there in heaven? Notice, let's continue on here. Verse 11, we're going to see, see something special. In verse 11, it says, And when the king came in to see the guests, so everyone now has been called to the wedding, right? The wedding is now taking place. And the king goes and he's inspecting the guests. He saw there a man which had not a wedding garment. And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither, not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. The wedding is taking place while God's people are being investigated. As we come to the wedding, as we are there as guests, as we are there as the very bride, joined together with Christ, we are there at the wedding, we are being investigated. This is the investigative judgment, the very judgment that we are now a part of right now. And God is checking to see, do we have the righteousness of Christ? Are we clothed with those garments that God promised to cover us with? So we're going to continue on. So we see that the wedding is taking place during this investigation, during the judgment. The judgment has not yet closed. The decision who is going to be a part of that wedding party, um, we still have a choice, right? We have a choice whether or not to be there a part of this. It's up to us. But God's servants are calling. Come to the wedding, he says. But go to Matthew 25, and we see another picture of another wedding. During this time of investigation, during this time where we are called and we're called to be members, guests of the wedding, brides there at the wedding, during this investigation, all that guest had to do was ask. All he had to do was ask for a garment. All we have to do right now is ask to be members, to be brides, for God to clothe us. All we have to do is ask. We have another picture here, Matthew 25, beginning in verse 1. It says, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps, but they took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go you out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. We need to know when this is taking place. When does the bridegroom call out? When are the servants calling out that the bridegroom has come? Is it as he's coming in the clouds to receive us? When all fates have already been decided... And we see Jesus Christ, it's the very second coming, and we're going up to heaven with him. Is that when we hear the call that the bridegroom has come? No. The bridegroom is calling now. The call to meet him is happening right now because the bridegroom has already come. He has come to his temple to begin a work of judgment. That is where he is at. He has started that investigation, and he is calling every single one of us to get ready. Now notice something here in verse 7 where it says, they, Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. You know what that Greek word for trimmed is? It's cosmeo. Cosmeo. What word do we get from the word cosmeo? Cosmetics. What are cosmetics used for? To make us look better, right? <laughs> cosmetics. These virgins rose up and they got themselves ready. 
they prepared themselves. But notice that all ten of them prepared themselves. Five were wise and five were foolish. Five of them did not make it into that wedding party. But all ten of them got ready. Isn't it a sad picture that all of them had lamps? What does the Bible use as a symbol for a lamp? It's His Word. So we have five women, as a symbol of God's people here, five women that they got themselves ready. They had some outward signs that they had prepared themselves. These five that were foolish even had the Word of God in their hands. Is that not a sad picture that some, even having the Word of God in their hands, may be found lost? What was it that they were missing? Looking at verse 8, it says, And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps have gone out. It's not enough to have a Bible, to even read it or to study it. It's not enough to have outward signs that we have outward reforms, that we're doing good things. It's not enough. We have to have the oil. We have to have God's Spirit in our life. True reform, true connection to God's Word is only made possible through His Spirit. It is a good thing to be trimmed. It is a good thing to be prepared. The word cosmeo there throughout the Bible is used as a word to be adorned. It's a good thing to be prepared and to be ready, to have outward reform. It's a good thing to have the Word of God, but we have to have His Spirit. This is the only way that we can have that true connection with God. As, now notice what happens. We go in, verse 9. So the lamps have gone out for the foolish, but in verse 9 it says, But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go you rather to them that sell and buy for yourself. While they went out to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage. So now they've entered in. The marriage has begun. And then what happens? It says... The door was shut. Anytime in Bible stories that you see a shut door, that needs to tell you that this is a type of the close of probation. The close of probation happens while we are here on this earth. The marriage begins while we are still here on this earth. Those who are going to be in the wedding or out of the wedding is decided while we are still here on this earth. The preparation and the call that is going out for us to get ready, for us to trim our lamps, is going out right now. For us to be the bride of Christ, God is calling us to be a part of that wedding, to come into the marriage. Everything is ready. Come into the marriage. The door was shut. Then we will see Christ come back to receive those who by faith were a part of that wedding. Look at Luke 12. I want us to go there. Luke 12. Luke 12, Luke 12 and verse 35. This is here speaking to those virgins. Luke 12, verse 35 through 37 says, Let your loins be girded about, and your lights burning, and you yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord, when he will return from the... So after the wedding is already complete, then Jesus Christ comes back. It says, When he returns from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. The marriage takes place during the investigative judgment. When that judgment is complete, the wedding and the marriage is consummated, and then Christ comes back to receive his people because he wants to take us up for the reception. When we go up to heaven, we're joining him for that wedding reception. Look at Revelation 19 and verse 7. Revelation 19 and verse 7 says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is 
come. It's here. It's now. We're being called to be a part of it. And his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These things are the true sayings of God. We are being called to the marriage supper, and it is only adorned with the righteousness of Christ that we can be a part of that wedding, that we can be a part of that marriage, and that we can join Christ in person for the reception. Go with me to our last text, Revelation 21, and we'll see just this. Revelation 21 and verses 9 and 10. It says, And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. The new Jerusalem. This is his bride. This was a symbol of his people. This was his kingdom. As soon as the subjects of his kingdom are made up, Christ is able to receive his kingdom. You see that there in Daniel chapter 7. Once the judgment is complete, God is able to receive his kingdom. He's able to be married to his people, and he's able to come down here and receive us and take us up for that wonderful reception. Can you not wait to sit on that table miles long? And we are told that Jesus himself will wait on his people. He will serve us. All types of fruits, almonds, pomegranates, everything that we can possibly imagine on that silver table. We will be there for that reception. And we will get to be there with the one that we are espoused to now. But we can't be there for that reception unless we come to the marriage unless we are there wearing the garments, the very robes of righteousness, and are a part of that wedding now. He's calling every single one of us to come to the wedding. The marriage supper is ready. Come to the wedding. Because there's going to come a point in time when the door shuts and no one else is able to come in. Only those who have the robes of righteousness will be there. And so this is the calling. God's servants are still speaking to us through his word, calling us to be there and to be a part of this. Let's get ourselves ready. Let's trim our lamps. Let's have the word of God, and let's be praying for the outpouring of God's spirit so that we can be a light to the rest of the world because we have become God's servants now, giving the light to the rest of the world, calling everyone else to come in. It's so good that it's not just good enough for me that we want our friends, we want our families and our neighbors to be there and to be a part of this. Amen? Amen. So we have been called to this. We have been called to be that bride of Christ. Amen. So let us, let us act accordingly. We are brides to the king of the universe. Let's show ourselves to be that. And let us get ourselves ready. Amen? Amen. Amen.